I'm with um, Gaia, that's the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, or Global Anti-Incinerator Alliance. We have about 650 members, thank you, Paul, um, in 90 countries who are fighting incinerators, fighting landfills, and working on zero waste for the long term, not to have to keep fighting new facilities every few years. When I talk about incineration, I'm talking about burning garbage, right? There's lots of different names for burning garbage, and there's lots of different ways you can do it. The first is you throw it in and you light it on fire. That's the conventional incinerator. That's what the incinerators in the US are all using that sort of technology. Um, there's also gasification, plasma pyrolysis in countries like Japan in the European Union, where they actually have commercial experience with these sorts of technologies to treat municipal solid waste. They all consider these technologies incineration. There's a big name game going on in the US right now. Is this incineration? Is it not incineration? What is it? It's incineration. Let's just skip to the chase and, and cut on from there, right? This at the bottom is the thermoselect incinerator in Japan, used gasification technology, operated for about four years and lost half a billion dollars in the process, was shut down in 2004 and no longer exists. It was deconstructed. There's a lot of reasons why people come out in the streets to stop incinerators and to call for zero waste. This is from Indonesia in 2007. I like this, this picture a lot from a, a student action against the Detroit incinerator a few years ago because it, it covers <laughs> quite a lot of issues here. So we're just going to stare at these awesome kids for a while because they really they got it down. Okay, Let's start with uh, dirty. We don't smoke, so why does our city? Okay, Toxic pollution, all right? I mean, I know you already know this, but you know, 20, 30 years ago when we were fighting incinerators, we were still talking about the same issues now with the new surge of incinerator proposals. Okay. There are thousands of pollutants that come out of the smokestacks of incinerators. Nanoparticulates, talk to Paul, he gave us a lecture for hours about nanoparticulates and the, the, the danger that is being totally ignored by the EPA and other agencies. And you know, a lot of incinerators spend hundreds of millions of dollars to concentrate these chemicals and put them in the ash, where we now have to have a whole new problem to deal with, toxic ash. Quite expensive. Don't want to go there, right? Why are we doing this? When I talk about dirty, I don't just mean toxics. I'm talking about climate pollution. So if you burn waste and, and recover some energy from it, you actually create more greenhouse gases than a coal plant per unit of energy. All right, more greenhouse gases than a coal plant. This is not green energy, right? Let's we got to got to keep questioning and checking that um, that claim by the industry. That leads us to environmental justice, which, as you can imagine, in Detroit is a really big issue. The Detroit incinerator pretty close to downtown, burns, incineration, burns uh, garbage from all around Detroit, from very um, affluent white suburbs here in Detroit. Uh, you can't really read the sign, but it says $170 a ton to burn, which is what the residents of Detroit were paying at the time that this protest happened, $35 a ton to reduce. Citizens from, or, or residents of, of other um, cities around Detroit were paying something like $13 a ton because of the way that the contracts were written. So not only are the citizens of Detroit or residents of Detroit uh, breathing in the air from the other people's garbage, they're paying to burn other people's garbage. All right? So there's, there's really screwy ways that contracts get written and, um, and end up being really problematic for host communities. Um, and another point is you might have heard in 1987 of the Toxic Waste and Race Report that came out from Dr. Robert Bullard that showed that um, people or communities of color were more likely to host a new waste facility than other communities. Uh, he did a follow-up to that in 2007, and he found it's actually more true. In 2007, it's more likely that a waste facility will get lighted, will get sited near a community of color than before. Um, so we, we have a lot, of, a lot of ground to cover on that issue. Waste of money, as that, as that sign gets to. Incinerators are tremendously expensive. The residents of Detroit have paid over a billion dollars on their incinerator over the last 20 years, a billion dollars, and I know that if you gave them a billion dollars, they'd be getting pretty far on reducing, reuse, and recycling. Frederick, Maryland is considering spending $600 million on a new incinerator, conventional mass burn incinerator. So we're not talking chump change here. This is really expensive stuff, and you know that if, that if people working on zero waste were given these sorts of resources, we could get a lot done. Green jobs, which you can barely see on this picture right here. Um, Jobs is another really big issue that, that brings people together to call for zero waste incentive incinerators. If you look just at recycling, you can create at least 10 times as many jobs as you could if you sent that material to landfills or incinerators, not to mention deconstruction, reuse, right? 
Um, we're working on a study with a number of uh, labor unions that will be coming out very soon, showing that if we had a, a national focus on reuse, on recycling, on composting, and if we hit 75% uh, reduction through those strategies alone, we would create 1.5 million new jobs. And those are jobs that we need in this country right now. So there's a lot of reasons that we really need to be focusing on zero waste instead of burning. I'm going to come back to jobs in a second. We had a, a great intern this summer who is from Japan, who used to work for a local government in Japan, um, and was working on their zero waste plan at this local government called Hayama. And he spent the summer for us helping us understand incineration in Japan. Now, you may not know that, or some of you know, that, in, that Japan has more incinerators alone, in Japan alone, than the rest of the world combined. So Japan is invested heavily, all right? Way down, you can see the bottom, 80% of their garbage is burned. Recycling is only actually 20%. It's growing slowly, 20% in Japan, all right? So you can see when you invest in the wrong direction, it's really hard to pull it back. And Japan is actually trying to some degree, to their credit, but uh, the, the capacity going to incinerators is going down somewhat. Recycling is going up somewhat, but it's incredibly slow. I hesitate to call it progress. The other thing about Japan is that it's not about energy. There's hardly any energy that you can get out of it compared to um, the energy that you can conserve through recycling and reuse and remanufacturing. In Japan, only 24% of incinerators are set up to recover energy because they know that's not the primary purpose. They're trying to reduce the volume of the garbage. That's all they're trying to do. And so when someone tells you it's about energy, it's not. It's about reducing the volume, and we have better ways to do that. One in five gasification incinerators actually end up generating net energy to the grid in Japan. You'll also hear that from gasification companies. We're going to be all about the energy. It's not working so well in Japan, and this is the first time we've actually had numbers where we're able to contact local governments and say, what's happening with your gasification incinerators? Brazil started a, founded a new anti-incinerator coalition just last month. Um, it's being led, for the most part, by the MNCR. That's the National Movement of Catadores, or Recyclers. So these are informal recyclers who have organized themselves, a huge movement, hundreds of thousands of people, who are organizing to stop incinerators. First, the Sao Paulo incinerator, but lots of others across the country. They are working on, they, these guys know recycling more than anybody, all right? This is their livelihood. This is how they bring food, you know, money home to feed their kids, right? So these folks know it, and they're working with the environmental groups, the climate groups, the toxic groups all across Brazil. It's really, it's a very exciting moment in Brazil, and they're going to be working on Rio Plus 20, which is happening next year, to, um, to bring zero waste to the attention of the global community. Um, okay, so good news. No new incinerators in the U.S. since 1997, thanks to many of you in this room. All right, it's, it's been amazing work. Over 40 proposals have been stopped in the last few years in, uh, in the U.S. 40 proposals. We are facing a pretty big uphill battle on incineration these days, all right? I just want to make that clear. Uh, and companies like Covanta are pushing for renewable energy credits, which is crazy in this economy when we're talking about the most expensive way to generate electricity, according to the Department of Energy. The most expensive way to generate electricity, most expensive way to handle your waste, and such a waste of jobs. Total, total waste. So I want to thank you all for being here, and I really look forward to the rest of the day and the, our discussions. Thank you.